Matthew chapter 14. And uh, we'll start in verse 13. And uh, we're going to talk about Lord over all, how Jesus Christ is the Lord over all. And what that means, because it's easy to just say those three words, right? And it's easy to kind of, I think, float along with some assumptions about what the lordship of our uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ means. But I want to I want to get a little bit more specific with this today because I believe that the scripture gets a bit more specific with it. And our big idea for you today, and you actually have fill-ins in your big idea. Ooh, we're up in that not a notch here. Your big idea is this. Jesus demonstrated his lordship over all in a variety of ways. Number one, it's character. We see the character of the lordship of Jesus Christ, and we'll obviously talk about what that means. We talk about its expanse or how big it is. We talk about the expanse of the lordship of Jesus Christ, and we will talk about the result. So it's character, it's expanse, and its result. It's character, it's expanse, and its result. And we see these worked out in a few of the things that Jesus does in this passage. We're going to look at, it's sort of like three different uh, kind of progressive bits of narrative that, that we see. We follow Jesus through, and we see these, uh, the lordship of Jesus, how it comes out here in this passage. So, uh, we're going to be in Matthew 14, starting in verse 13, but your first fill in the blank for your first main point anyways, we're going to talk about the character of his lordship. And Jesus feeding 5,000 shows his lordship has exodus overtones. Jesus feeding the 5,000 shows that his lordship has exodus overtones. And so as you uh, read the book of Exodus, or read the, the narrative of the Exodus. What is it about? What is the purpose? What is the point of the Exodus? What is trying to be accomplished there? What is God doing? Gonna go, this, is, this is interactive portion. So what's going on in the Exodus? Why, is the, why did God do the Exodus? What was the point? Somebody give me an answer. Okay, set aside his people before he sets aside his people. That's absolutely part of it. He has to do something else. Deliverance. Deliverance. It is rescue. Yeah. Liberty in Christ. So the liberty, the deliverance, the setting aside of the people uh, for a special purpose. And that's the, the overtones of what Jesus is actually doing with the feeding of the 5,000. Sometimes I think that we have, the, we have, we have a danger of when we read uh, the, the text of the New Testament or the text of the Bible at any point, is that we might get caught up in just sort of the surface level details of what's happening and miss the, the kind of the underlying pointing or point of the passage. And that's what we're going to do with the feeding of the 5,000 here. So the feeding of the 5,000 shows the lordship of Jesus has exodus overtone. So Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place, by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he found a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. 
Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds and they all ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides the women and children. Now I want to key in on a handful of phrases in this passage that bring out the uh, sort of the Exodus idea here. The very first thing is right away. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place, a desolate place. And the idea behind desolate is this is a wild place. There's nothing that's been cultivated here. There's nothing that's been arranged by the hand of man to sustain life. It's just sort of deserted. There's nobody who lives here. And this is the first callback to the Exodus, because after God rescues his people Israel out of the land of Egypt, what does he do? Where does he take them? He takes them to the mountain, okay? takes them to the mountain, speaks to them. We've actually already had moments that echo that. That was the Sermon on the Mount. But now he's out in the desolate place because in the Exodus, after he speaks to them at the mountain, what do they do for 40 years or so? They wander, and where do they wander? In the desert, in the wilderness. This is call back to the Exodus, He's in a desolate place with all of these people. Yes, yeah, so in the Exodus, God led the people into the wilderness. The wilds were the place where God covenants with his Old Testament people after he rescues them. And part of the point of the ministry of Jesus, and this is something that we said way back at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, for those of you who are here for that. What we find in the ministry of Jesus is a new Exodus. There are all sorts of Exodus callbacks throughout the life and ministry of Jesus, going all the way back to when he was a small child. Remember when, for example, uh, you know, Herod found out, Herod the Great found out about the birth of Jesus. He got crazy upset and then had boys slaughtered. Okay, call back to what the Pharaoh did in the Exodus before God rescues his people out of uh, Egypt. Because the Pharaoh was afraid, of the, uh, was afraid of the Hebrews, and he therefore had all the boys slaughtered. Very similar to what Herod does. And there are all of these things that you can see throughout the Gospel of Matthew in particular, but also throughout some of the other Gospels that call back to this rescuing, covenanting, saving moment called the Exodus. And so Jesus is signifying what he's up to is saving-oriented work. And then what Jesus does is that he says, he, you know, he's, he's healing the sick, and the day draws on and on until it's finally the end of the day, and the disciples say, all right, whew, we're tired. We kind of had enough of this, Jesus. It's look at the time, we're hungry, send these people away to get something to eat. And Jesus says, no. Nah. You give him something to eat. You know, he's, he's playing with them a little bit here. And they say, well, we don't, we don't have enough for them. And he says, bring me what you have. And then he breaks the loaves and the fishes, right? And then he divides it up and sends it out. And everybody eats and everybody is satisfied. So he broke the loaves and gave them to them. Jesus shows that he's the Lord by his miraculously multiplying food. How does God feed his people in the Exodus? He miraculously multiplies food, right? So in the wilderness, they're like, okay, we don't have anything. We, we didn't bring lunch with us like for 40 years supply. Lord, what are we going to do? And the Lord supplies manna. And the Lord supplies quail for them to eat. So they are full and they are satisfied. So there's, once again, these Exodus overtones of the Lord is providing for his people. Not only does he rescue them, not only does he take them out of bondage, but he also then supplies their need for all that they have in the wilderness moment. God miraculously provided manna and quail, and he miraculously provides here loaves and fishes. But once again, this is not simply about Hey, look, Jesus messes with physics. 
and he multiplies and he, and he makes more of something. That, I mean, there's part of that because he's Lord of creation, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But he's doing something that points to the fact that all that you truly need comes from this rescuing God. See, we have funny ideas about all the stuff that we, quote, need. It's an interesting word, need, because of the way that we've used it. Well, I need this. Well, right now I need to get to this place. Well, right now what I really need is a double cheeseburger. You know, I, Maybe two. Throw in a shamrock shake there or something. I don't know. But yeah, so we have these, these ways in which we express our, quote, needs. But what we most often mean by the word need is, this is what I want. This is what I would like to have. Notice that Jesus does not take, like, orders. Like, all right, well, what do you, what do you have? He doesn't do that. What does he do? He says, this is what I'm willing to provide because this is what you need. This is what will satisfy. This is what is, is, is required for you right now. Are you hungry? I will feed you. I will feed you. And he does. He, he provides what his people need. He did so in the Exodus. He's doing so at that moment. And he's actually doing so at this moment because he has provided for our greatest need, which is himself. So elsewhere, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He's that which we require. He's that which truly satisfies. And the, all of this Exodus imagery is always about pointing to our need to be obey and submit and to receive God himself. This is our greatest need. And this is what Jesus is pointing to in this moment. And we have this, they all ate and were satisfied because what God provides, just like in the song that we sang earlier, is enough. All of you is more than I need. For every thirst... All of you is more than enough. That's why we sang that song, because we're going to run into this passage today. Because God is satisfactory. What God provides is enough, because God, of course, provides himself. Jesus is the true bread of life. We feed on him by having faith. That's how you feed on Christ. We do this thing every once in a while called communion. We did it last week, right? And that is a picture, that's an image, that's a pointer for us to remind us that what we truly need to feed upon is Christ. What we truly need to feed upon is Christ. And he gives us himself. He gives us all that we need by giving us himself. So that's another Exodus pointer because the, everybody had enough in the Exodus. They had enough manna and they had enough quail. Well, here they have enough loaves and they have enough fishes. And you and I have enough Christ. We don't need more. We have all the Christ, all the bread of life that we need. He has given us all that we need. So let us be mindful that he has given us all enough and we are to be satisfied in him and then at the end of this uh, moment where he's fed everybody right it says 5,000 men as well as women and children so we're looking at a crowd anywhere from like 10 to 15,000 at least is how many people he satisfactorily fed he says after that they gathered up baskets of food. How many baskets do they gather? Twelve. Gee, do you think there's any Exodus significance in that? How many tribes of Israel are there? Twelve. Now, we're not going to talk about it right now, but I'm going to put this bug in your ear because we'll get to this passage in a few weeks. There's another passage where Jesus feeds a large group of people like this, but it's, it's, the, it's called the feeding of the 4,000. How many baskets full 
are gathered up there. Do you know? Anybody know? Seven. And I want you to think about why. And it's very similar to what's going on here. Maybe if, you, maybe if you study really hard, you can suss out what's going on there. And we'll, I'll reveal that answer when we get to that, that passage in a few weeks. But there's another kind of one of these moments where Jesus is sort of exodusing stuff. And we'll get to that in a while, a couple of weeks, like I said. But yeah, so this points to the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 baskets full. God is reforging. He is renewing. He is reconstituting. Israel, his people. That's what he's doing here. This is rechartering his people. That's what Jesus is doing. He's at the center of these 12 as the Yahweh figure, because that's who he actually is. He's Yahweh. He's the Old Testament God in human flesh. And he's calling Israel around himself with these 12 disciples. And that's, by the way, who we are. We are the renewed people of God. Going all the way back, there's continuity between us and the Old Testament in that regard. We are this renewed Israel. That's why Jesus calls 12 men around himself. That's what's going on there. So that's the character of Jesus' lordship is the rescuing lordship. It's the exodusing lordship. It's the saving lordship that we find when we observe the feeding of the 5,000. All right, so that's the character of his lordship. Now let's talk about the expanse of his lordship. And this is Jesus walking on water shows his lordship over all creation. Jesus walking on water shows his lordship over all creation. Over all creation. Now, when you open up your Bible for the very first time and you read maybe from the beginning and you start in the book of Genesis, because, well, that's where the Bible starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. And what comes next? Does anybody know? The darkness is on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, over the waters. This creation's initial state is particularly watery, right? God calls land forth out of it, and so there's this walking on water is going to have some echoes of what's going on there a little bit. So let's go ahead and read the, the walking on water bit. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So I'm going to bypass most of the beginning of that. Okay, he disperses the people. He goes on the mountain to pray. The disciples are in the boat. And they're not making great progress because, and this is actually very common in the Sea of Galilee, storms kind of show up almost out of nowhere and cause problems for those on boats. Okay? 
Jesus goes down to the water. He walks out on the water. And he goes, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, here's something I tell you. I used to live at the coast. Okay, We used to live in Rockaway Beach. And here's something I can tell you about the sea. I can tell you about the water. If you don't respect the water, the water will kill you. I cannot tell you how many times we heard the, the emergency sirens in the summertime because somebody either went too far out and couldn't get back or they were doing something foolish and they got swept out to sea. At least one person a year was killed. At least one person a year usually was killed because they didn't respect the water. Because the water is powerful because the water is strong. I used to love to go down to the beach in the morning sometimes and just stand and look at the waves because it was just such a powerful expression of what God had done in creation. It was amazing, it was beautiful, and it was just something soothing about looking at that and knowing that if I stood on the sand, I was safe from that power. Unless there was like an earthquake or something, then I would be in trouble, but... The idea is when you don't respect the water, it can kill you. What's fascinating about this passage here is that the water respects Jesus. The water respects its master because there's one present who is more powerful than the water. There's one present more able, more strong, or stronger than the immense strength contained in the sea. Now, this is, this is the, a picture of one who is master over creation. As we said, if you go back and look at the very beginning of the Bible, the picture of the initial creation is a chaotic, watery place. Okay? When God creates the world initially, it is powerful and chaotic and uncontrolled. And it's when the Spirit of God hovers over the water that the creation begins under God's uh, statements to take shape. It's when God says, all right, this is what we're going to do, that the water begins to respond, that the, the world begins to respond, that land begins to come forth and begins to sprout life, and, and people come about on the sixth day. But initially, it's this chaotic, watery creation, and there's a similarity here. Because these disciples are out on this chaotic, watery thing, the sea, and here comes undisturbed Jesus. And he's not afraid. And he has to say to his disciples, don't be afraid. It's me. It's me. As if you're in a boat that's being tossed by waves and wind that you know to be dangerous. And having somebody come out and say, hey, don't worry about it. It's me. But in Jesus' case, it should be enough. In Jesus' case, it should be enough because he's the one who's master over this creation. Because when you don't respect the water, it can kill you. But the water respects Jesus, for he is its creator. Mm, there we are. Ma uh, Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20, talking about uh, Jesus' position and place over the creation. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, it's talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation, or of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, I want us to think for a moment about redemption, and I want us to think a moment about salvation, because we typically think about it in terms of what happens to me when I die. 
Well, if I'm saved personally, I get to be forever with God, right? Is that all that salvation is? Well, not according to this passage. According to this passage, salvation is creation-wide. Yes, it includes your eternal destiny, but it is the entirety of the broken, sinful creation that Jesus aims to save, and that he accomplishes that salvation in his death, burial, and resurrection. If the created matter ordered nothing, the resurrection makes zero sense. You realize that resurrection would make zero sense because if it was all about simply getting away from creation and getting away from the corruption of creation, then Jesus would have arisen as a spirit and nothing more. But the resurrection is actually a statement on what God intends to do with the entirety of creation. Go read Romans chapter 8. For the whole creation groans as in the pains of childbirth, waiting for the adoption of the sons of God. Why does the creation care? Because after the sons of God receive their resurrection body, the creation knows it's next. What is God doing by having Jesus walk on water here? He's signifying something. He's Lord over all creation, and he intends to fix all of creation. He intends to save it all. He's not going to destroy it and toss it in a garbage bin somewhere. The resurrection that Jesus went through is the resurrection we get to go through is the resurrection the entire created order gets to go through. God cares about it all. So Jesus says, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Being in the presence of clear and true holiness. Being in the presence of true and clear holiness has a tendency to undo us because we see our unholiness by comparison. So they actually have to be told not to be afraid because when they see him walking on the water, they're not afraid of the water anymore. They're afraid of him. My favorite example of this is Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah has a vision in the temple of God with his train fill, uh, the train of his robe filling the temple, and the, the living creatures crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He says, uh, this has just undone me to be in the presence of such holiness. But God, in this moment, through the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Lord Jesus Christ is God in human flesh, steps into this moment and says, I know you're scared, but you can trust me. Don't be afraid. It's me. Don't be afraid. It's me. They've known Jesus for a little while now. They've spent time with him. And he says to them, you guys know me. Don't be afraid. Which is kind of something important for us. Spend time with Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Because when you get to know Jesus, you get to know what the truly, fully, greatly holy God is like. And he wants you to be in loving relationship with him. Do not be Afraid. Do not be afraid. Then it is this really weird moment, as if the rest of this isn't strange so far, right? Where Peter says, all right, if it's you, Lord, tell me to come walking out on the water to you. And Jesus says, all right, come. And Peter gets out of the boat. Okay, Peter, <laughs> what are you thinking? What are you doing, Peter? And in our context, this not might make very much sense. But in that context, it actually makes a fair amount of sense. 
Because what is Peter to Jesus? He's a disciple. He's a follower of Jesus. And here's the thing about disciples. This is what a disciple does. They don't just follow around a teacher so that they can get the knowledge that the teacher has. So I don't want to just know what the teacher knows. The disciples wanted to learn to do what the teacher does. And when Peter, a disciple, sees his Lord, his master, his rabbi, walking on the water, I want to do what I see my rabbi doing. So he, Lord, can I do that? Can I do that? Come. Come on out here. Go ahead. Okay. You have to, what was that moment like, like right before he swung his leg over the edge of the boat? Like, okay, here we go. All right. How terrifying would that be? And he puts his foot down on the water and he doesn't go through. He lifts his other leg out, which would probably be a little bit more scary of the two parts. And he starts to walk on the water. But then something happens to Peter. Something happens to Peter. What happens to Peter? It says he looked at the wind and the waves. And he became afraid and began to sink. When he saw the wind and the waves, he was afraid. Of course, of course they were afraid of Jesus. This is the holy God in their midst. But the problem is, Peter became afraid of the creation more than he was afraid of his master. He began to say, oh no, this is dangerous. But proper reverence for God actually bolsters our faith over scary things. If you were to go, and this is just one example, Proverbs 9, 10, but it says it at several points, so we don't have to go there. I'll just give you the gist. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, which is not just like, oh no, I'm scared, I'm going to be, it's the, I have reverence and awe. And yes, that may cause me to tremble, as it did in Isaiah's case, as it does in uh, the disciples' case when they see Jesus walking on the water initially. Like, ah. But the fear of the Lord, the reverence, the respect, the love for the Lord is the beginning, it's the starting point of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then Jesus rescues Peter because Peter is sinking. And then it says they got back into the boat. And when they got back into the boat, the wind ceased, just like that. So think about that for a second. At what point could Jesus have simply said, oh no, my disciples are out on a boat on the water and there's this terrible storm. Why didn't he just stop it right then and there? Because he could have. Why doesn't he? He intended not to for a purpose. This is not a coincidence. The wind was blowing at his command to make a point that he is the Lord over all creation. He needed them to see, or rather they needed to see it. Yeah. It was a lesson. It was a lesson. Jesus didn't need a storm for himself. The disciples needed it. The disciples needed the storm. Jesus is the Lord of creation. He could have stopped that storm at any point he wanted to. He chose not to do it until that moment, though, because he was trying to make a point for them. He was trying to make a point for them. It's that same moment uh, sort of thing when he's in the back of the boat, sleep, right? Terrible storm. Disciples are freaking out. Lord, don't you care? We're going to die. Wakes up. All right, fine, I'll take care of it. 
not concerned at all. Because he's the master over all creation. And the response, the, the, at the end of this little passage, the response is the, the point for us. It drives home what our response to Jesus ought to be. They worshipped him and said, truly you are the son of God. They worshipped him. This may be the first hint that we have that the disciples are beginning to understand Jesus' divine nature. It's one of the, the earliest occurrences of somebody going, Son of God. It's one of the first moments that we see this. Because here's the thing about disciples. Here's the thing about anybody who's Jewish at that time. There's only one that's worthy of worship. They have these 10 commandments, right? Aside from the other 613 or whatever. And right at the beginning, have no other gods before me. Make no graven images. Don't worship anything else besides me. No other gods. Don't worship wood and stone and stuff that you make. You worship me, not stuff that is made. Here the disciples worship Jesus. They're starting to get it. They're starting to get it. This is one of the reasons we do church. It's not necessarily so that first and foremost, oh, I might get a warm fuzzy, or I might get something out of this. You might get something out of this. But the first point of church is give worship to God. He is the point. He is the point. Number three, let's talk about the result of Jesus' lordship. Jesus' healings show his lordship brings restoration to his people. Jesus' healings show that his lordship brings restoration to his people. This is about restoration. It's about Exodus, it's about Lord over all, and it's about the restoration of God's people. Matthew 14, verses 34 through 36. And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. All that region brought out all who were sick. Now, this isn't like, oh, no, this person has a cold or they've got the flu. What's in view here is long-term, debilitating, life-threatening problems. These are serious illnesses. Recognizing Jesus means knowing and believing he heals our greatest disease. Sin and death. That's what following Jesus means. First and foremost, we have faith in the one who can deliver us from sin and death. Not just, oh, Jesus might give me a little bit of a better life. Ah, oh, Jesus will smooth things out for me. You know, frequently, he doesn't smooth things out for us. What he does do is take care of our biggest problem. The fact that we're born dead in trespasses and sins. And he enables us to have a relationship with a holy God, which otherwise we could not have. Jesus cure, heals and cures our biggest problem. And this interesting little moment here that echoes something that we've already read a few chapters back. They implored him that they might 
only touch the fringe of his garment. Why? Because it's in fulfillment of a prophecy. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, there's this messianic prophecy about the coming Messiah, and it says, he, the son of righteousness, S-U-N, son, the sun that rises. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its... Now, here's where the, the bit comes in. Depending on your translation, it might say a couple of different things. It might say rays. It might say wings. It might say something else. But the word that stands behind that in Hebrew is the word kanaf, and it means corner. And it's the exact same word in the book of Numbers that where God says and commands the people put fringes on the corner of their garments. Fringes. Well, what, is, we, what does it say here in uh, Matthew? They implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garment. Well, in Malachi, the son of righteousness rises with healing in his fringes. They want, to, they want to touch the corners of his garments where the fringe is because they know this prophecy. There's healing there. Even if you don't touch us, even if you, you know, don't spend a whole lot of time, it will just let us touch the fringe of your garment because we know what the word says. So if we have faith in you, there's healing available to us. And the fringe of the garment is something that if it, if it passed by you and it brushed against you, it would be the lightest touch. It's not like it's this hard contact cloth or something like that. It's just tiny fringe. If you've ever rubbed fringe across your skin, it's just very light. And, and the point is, is that it doesn't take much for Jesus to heal someone. He can do it because he has the power. He is fully able to bring about the healing that we need. Now, in our case, that may not be a physical healing. And, and in many cases, it's not. In some cases, it is. But the point is, the, the full healing that Jesus brings is the healing of our death, our deadness to God by forgiving our sin by forgiving that which separates us from God. Then it says, as many as touched it, touched the fringe, were made well. Jesus restores his people first by granting salvation, second by daily sanctifying us by the Holy Spirit. There's this initial, I've, I'm saved, which is a positional, a standing thing. I have, I have a righteous position before God because my faith is in Christ. But there's a daily thing that happens in my life called sanctification, where day by day I die to myself and I learn to become more like Christ. And it's a long process. And it's a slow process. And it's a process where there are many stumblings, where there are many fallings, where there are many God picking me up. He doesn't just save me once, although that's eternal and secure, but he saves me perpetually from myself. He can only do this because he is Lord, because he is the supreme authority in heaven and on earth. Because his lordship means restoration. His lordship means restoration. His lordship means exodus, it means rescue, it means all creation, and it means restoration. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love over us, that you have shown us in your Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have given to us. He's our Lord. And his lordship means our rescue. His lordship means it's over all. It's supreme. There's no inch of creation that we may go over which he is not Lord. And it means that you are working on us. You have restored us by giving us salvation, but you also restore us daily 
through sanctification, through learning to obey, through learning to love, through learning to trust, through learning to worship you better every day. We pray, Father, now as we talk about what it means to be your disciples, that we would learn daily to bow down to you. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.